My name is Carter Johnson, and I cover banking and fintechs here at Insider. I'm joined today by two of the people leading transformational change in digital banking, Michael Tang of Deloitte and David Tyree of Bank of America. By now, a year into the pandemic, the numbers speak for themselves. 89% of banking customers now use some form of mobile banking tools. And it's not just Gen Z and millennials, that includes 79% of baby boomers like my parents, who are very active mobile banking users. Mobile banking features are now the second most important factor for customers choosing a bank. The only one more important are fees. This is from a recent insider study. Proximity to bank branches is now ranked fifth. And yet one thing remains more important than ever before. The same study said that security was ranked as the most in-demand mobile banking feature. We've all seen the news about data breaches across tech companies, and financial firms. In 2021 and into the future, mobile banking is not a nice to have, it's simply a must have. And competition for digital customers is as fierce as it's ever been before. Michael, you've mentioned during our pre-interview the burning needs dominating the conversation around digital at banks. I'd like to ask you, how have those needs been accelerated since the onset of the pandemic? Thanks, Carter. I was mentioning it's kind of unfortunate um, that it took a global pandemic to change some of the burning desires into a burning platform to really move towards digital channels. But if there's a silver lining at all, even in one of the most regulated industries such as financial services, organization has absolutely proved that they can actually move at great pace velocity and agility to meet these customers' demand. And as you know, everything from contact centers to mid-office and back office has really, really sped up because of the pandemic. And I think one of the great things coming out of this is it not only served that as a catalyst, but this is much more than just the front end of designing in terms of digital transformation or digitization. It replicates right through the mid-office and credit risk modeling all the way to the back office and core banking. And I actually think this is a, a great news story where it's going to continue to accelerate the transformation into the digital space. And I think you raise a great point there. And that's something I wanted to ask you, David, is you're, of course, head of digital banking across Bank of America, not just on the consumer side. And so I'd be curious to hear about some of the ways in which you're maybe applying some of the things you're learning in consumer digital to other areas of the bank, maybe on the corporate side or on the investment banking side. Sure, be happy to. First, uh, thanks for having me here today, and uh, thanks for letting me share the floor with Michael. I'm a huge reader of Michael's work, and uh, you know, it's just nice to be able to have uh, an opportunity to have interactions uh, with the two of you guys. So, you know, one thing before I go in and answer that particular question, you know, Michael really brought up an important point, which is the pandemic and the acceleration that's been going on. You know, we saw an acceleration in really three different areas. One was adoption of digital. Two was people seeking advice in the digital channel. And really three was the amount of new relationships that we garnered through our digital channels. Obviously, the pandemic, for you know all the reasons we always talk about, you know, drove those things. But if you think about it, you know, we bring on about a million new net digitally active users every year. In this year, we brought in a million in the first quarter. So you see this pent up amount that's that's going through, and you get adoption. And like you said, Carter, at the very onset, it's of all age cohorts. The actually the fastest growing cohort for our digital adoption is the 65 plus category. So that was one that took us a lot of time to kind of get going on that front. You know, when you think about the advice, you know, uh, people are actually coming in because of the uncertainty that's out there and looking for reassurance, looking for advice and guidance. And uh, that's been a big focus area uh, for our customer base. And then the last one is really this notion of new relationships. Pre-pandemic, we were at about 25 to almost 30% of all of our new customer acquisition was coming through digital. We're now at 50%. Um, so it's really kind of accelerated across the board. And to tie it back to your original question, when you think about digital across the entire Bank of America enterprise, the least common denominator is actually an end customer, one single end customer, whether you know it's somebody in the consumer bank or actually it's a CFO and we're providing tools and capability for on a commercial banking side of things. They have the same 
same needs. It's the same common ground. They're looking for ease, convenience, safety. They're looking for things to be relevant and timely, and they're looking for uh, a partner. It just happens to be through the digital means. So we're taking the same building blocks that we built that got us to about 52 million digital users in the consumer bank, and now starting to, as I call it, the uh, consumerization of the commercial banking sector. Got it. And, you know, I think that's a great point about really thinking about the end customer. And to that end, I feel like we're hearing a lot about personalization within digital and within digital banking. David, I'm curious if you'd have any thoughts about, one, what personalization actually means for the user experience, and two, the sort of tech that underpins, again, personalization. And Michael, feel free to follow on after that. Yeah, I'd love to hear Michael's comments on that as well. But we don't really call it personalization here. We call it individualization. And the difference between personalization and individualization is that you can personalize a digital experience for somebody, but if you individualize it, it's actually happening in real time. And so that's what we're building, is we're building a platform that is based on individualization. So when Michael logs into the Bank of America app, um, it is actually assembling itself real time to provide him the most relevant and timely information to be able to give him choices of next best step and to really pull together the content that's most important. You know, we believe that the days of having a, a mobile or an, an, an online experience that is click here, then click here, then click here, uh, those are going away really, really fast. It is come in and it assembles its own. We've done a couple things at Bank of America. And these are more long-term bets that we started a while ago. One is we have one platform for all mobile customers that we're migrating towards. So that means that if you're a Bank of America customer or a Merrill Lynch customer or a small business customer, you actually go into one app and it assembles itself. Obvious benefits to that because you're building once and you're being able to then deploy it amongst multiple lines of business rather than building a Merrill Lynch mobile application and a private bank application, a small business application across the board. So this notion, as you called it, personalization allows us to gain massive efficiencies, but also allows us to really drive a whole new level of customer experience and, you know, really expectations. It really becomes a trusted place for our customers. Oh, I love that. Like hyper-personalization is so 2020. The 2021 term is individualization now. I really like yep. that. And I think the cornerstone of this is obviously data, not just customer data, not just proprietary data within your organization, but how do you combine and syndicate it with other sources of data internally or externally to provide that individual experience? And Carter, you mentioned the mobile app, right? That's only one channel. If you do this across the enterprise, as you know, there's multiple channels, whether they're digital, ranch is still alive and well. And I think in the future, the notion of embedded banking will be very, very big. Therefore, you know, the first part of it is to show the data around individualization. We're right in that era of providing advice, which is through analytics and in some instances, AI machine learning. I think for the purposes and the theme of this discussion in the future, what's going to be disruptive between embedded banking and just do it for me. So you move from show me help me to just do it for me. And that's where that customer experience is really going to kick to the next level that's individual to each and every customer. And, you know, as you say, Michael, this all comes down to data. And data is obviously a very expansive term. And we're talking about big data and a lot of data. And I mentioned at the top, you know, the importance of particularly uh, from the retail perspective, people are worried about their data and people are worried about what happens with their data and the uses for it. And so I'd be curious, uh, Michael, maybe if you could first talk about how you think about the nature between data, a retail customer, and the trust they're putting into their financial institution. Yeah, I think a couple um, lenses or dimensions. I think, number one, the regulations of data is still somewhat inconsistent. So the promise of global harmonization is not quite there yet. And I, I know the, the audience might predominantly be in North America right now, but if you look at the EU and all those legislations and regulations apply globally, something such as GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, it's really trying to protect the privacy of customer data. 
But at the same time, the EU has open banking, which encourages sharing of data. And it's up to both the customer consent and the incumbents to go figure out what that right balance is. And when you marry that with the ambitions of whether it's individualization or personalization, you always have to balance that cool versus creepy aspect. As a consumer, it could be really good and reduce the friction of doing things for me. But at the same time, Carter, to your point is, wow, where did they find that data? That's a little creepy. So I think it's going to be a constant balance between regulators and the amount of data and how you actually use that data. Got it. Understand. And, you know, David, kind of to that point as well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's something like 66 million unique experiences, 66 million touch points at, at Bank of America. And I'm curious how you think about the conversation around data and customer data and what that means kind of sitting here in, in the U.S. You know, that's exactly why I love reading Michael's stuff, because he just nailed it to a T on, you know, this whole notion of data and the the other side to what Michael said, just to build on it a little bit, is the experience the customer gets, the feeling a customer gets when you use the data right or when you do the data wrong. And that's one of the biggest drivers out there, Carter, is to keep a very close eye on that because it has to be relevant and timely. If you come into the Bank of America site and you're looking to do something, I should be using that data, both internal data as well as what Michael said, outside data to be able to say, here's something that's relevant and timely for you. And if you get that wrong, the experience is no good. So it's a tightrope that you walk. Now, one thing that we have also been thinking about and deploying over the last six months or so is actually using data that is captured based on customer input. So we have something called a life plan. And it essentially asks, what's important to you? And Michael might be on and say, well, it's family and it's home that's important to you. We're actually capturing that data, not rear view looking data, but what Michael really is, what's important to him. And we're actually combining that into the digital experience. So data is not only outside data, looking the review mirror, transaction-based data, looking the mirror, you got to incorporate forward-looking aspirational data. And, you know, we've got about three and a half million people who have used LifePlan. Our SAT scores across the bank and digital are in the, you know, 83, 84 range for those people who are using LifePlan and we're leveraging that aspirational data. It's 96% client SAT. So there's, there's some real learnings that are there. So to back to your question, yes, we have 66 million uh, customers here, and our job is to make them feel at the end of the day that the experience was in their best interest. So it's everything that you and Michael just said. It's a combination of leveraging the data, applying intelligence to the data, targeting your customers based on their need, not based on what you want to sell them, and then designing an experience that actually has some feeling to it in the form of kind of the EQ side. So it's a balance of IQ and EQ on that side. It's hard to do, really hard to do. If you think of all the things that Michael just said, that's really hard to execute against. But the, I think it's worth focusing on and attending because those who can do it well are going to be the big winners in the future. Got it. And, you know, again, I feel like so much of what we're talking about is about scale and about uh, the breadth of customers that is reached with a lot of the technologies we're talking about. And I'd love to hear, David, if you want to start first, but, you know, how you think about the importance of scale when it comes to digital banking. And, um, you know, kind of a follow on to that is, you know, we've heard some interesting CEO comments from some other banks about fintechs and the threat fintechs play to some of the nation's largest banks. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on fintechs and whether Bank of America kind of approaches them from a partnership perspective or from maybe a more adversarial relationship, given what they're trying to do in the industry. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I'll set the record straight from our standpoint. Any firm that plays in the, the industry of financial services has our respect. Michael said it at the onset most regulated industry out there, maybe, you know, or at least one of them. Massively complex. The risks are so great. You know, when you start talking about sizes of customer bases like Bank of America, it's 66 million. The scope is enormous on all those things. Well, everybody who plays in financial services has our respect. Every player, 
It doesn't matter if they're a fintech who started up three days ago or they're one of the big bank competitors. We have a team who watches them each and every day, every single day, to make sure that we understand what is, what is it our competitors are doing, where are they successful, where have they made missteps, and we learn from that. So just like we learn from every customer interaction, what our customers like and what they don't like, and how we use that to prioritize what goes into our tech planning and what goes into our release schedule, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we use the same kind of external data around our competition on it. Um, you know, the fintechs have done a phenomenal job of finding pain points within the system and addressing those pain points. The challenge that the fintechs had, I think you, you allude to, which is, can they get scale? You know, can they take something like a pain point in onboarding for a checking account and turn that into a solution for customers that includes lending, investing, borrowing, you know, the full spectrum of solutions? Because we do know that customers really value a one-stop shop solution that they can do their whole planning for their financial lives and have a partner on that side. So we watch them each and every day. Scale plays uh, an important part because... Uh, we have momentum, and when we get things right, we get it right in a big way. You know, for example, uh, when we launched Life Plan uh, that I was telling you about earlier, we launched it in October, and I had forecasted that we would bring in 500,000 new customers by the end of the quarter. I blew it, blew it big time. We brought in 2.5 million, <laughs> right? And that's because it was really good, and it worked, and it and it scaled out uh, on that side of things. So that's good. We've tried to adapt really fast. Um, you know, three years ago, we were doing tech releases once a quarter, and they were relatively large. And when you do large tech releases, you get a lot of that, who, where, who moved my cheese with customers saying, you change this, you change that. We decided to switch gears on that. We now do a, a tech release every 28 to 32 days, and we will put in 2,000 plus feature enhancements to our digital properties every single year. So we're able to move much quicker uh, than we ever have before because, you know, there are a lot of players out there who can move quickly. So. Got it. And Michael, I'd love it. Yeah. To jump in. <laughs> yeah. I would echo like, you know, with scale comes a lot of like power. I mean, what I mean by that is you get the efficiencies of scale and from a customer base, there is a degree of trust and loyalty and the feeling of safeness when you have that type of scale. I think if anything, the fintechs have learned that it's extremely difficult and costly to acquire customer bases of 66 million consistently. So they've learned to figure out how to partner with incumbents. I also believe what we can learn from fintechs is the notion of assembling products and services of the future, not just building them. It doesn't necessarily need to be in-house, it could be external with ecosystems, but with today's technology and usage of APIs, I believe to get that velocity coupled with scale, you're assembling things in a much more modular fashion. And if something changes, whether it's customer demand, regulations, a new competition comes into play, new technology, they're like Lego blocks where you can resize and reshift re things. And although fintechs obviously have innovated and disrupted financial services, I'd probably be also be fearful at looking outside of the industry. I believe industry lines are blurring. So as a customer, although we have this traditional taxonomy of financial services, technology, or telcos, autonomous driving manufacturers have more driver data than insurance companies. And insurance companies use traditional actuaries with risk modeling pools Companies have autonomous cars, have petabytes of data in individualized manner to underwrite insurance policies, way more accurate than risk pooling. I recently spoke with the telco in Southeast Asia, where out of a thousand attributes of phone usage, they just don't have, because they're unbanked, the financial health to risk score them. They have figured out through AI and machine learning how an individual charges their phone, when, and at what battery level is the best indicator of loan loss and credit risk. So, you know, between technologies and especially outside of financial services, if we're, the theme is about the future, I wouldn't just look at fintechs, I'd look outside of our industry of how we're gonna be disrupted. 
Michael brings up a really good point on the scale and looking outside. And, and I think it, you know, if you're a good business person in general, you're going to look at not only your direct competitors, but potential future competitors. And as Michael indicates outside this to kind of get some lessons learned and, you know, data is an important one uh, for that. So, you know, Michael also brought up the scale and when you get it right, I'll give you a couple examples here. You know, we've got so much data, not nearly as much as what Gar example Carter just gave, but we've got so much data here that we couldn't possibly sort through it on a manual basis. And that was part of the genesis of our, you know, AI solution, Erica. And yes, Erica interfaces with our customers on the engagement, but we use that same engine to help us drive engagement of new features that we put out. So I'll give you an example, Zelle, right? Lots of banks using Zelle that's out there. We have 14 million people actively using Zelle, right? And our ramp up was extreme. And how did we do that was we went in there and we leveraged our AI capabilities to be able to say, oh, look, you know, Carter keeps on writing these checks. Next time he comes into the property, introduce Zelle to him, right? Simple things like that. Right. And quick stat for you of the 14 million customers uh, who use Zelle, 75 percent no longer write any checks with Bank of America. Right. That's a big save on that side. And, you know, again, building off what Michael said, we look at the data and we come up with stats like Michael did that help us drive the engagement as well. So, for example, we have a stat that for a new customer coming on board at Bank of America, if you can get them to engage in two digital features, just make it up, Zelle and mobile check deposit, any two, 97% chance that after a year, they're going to remain digitally active. So get them to try it early and you go from there. So you take a stat like that and you put it in the hands of our 25,000 customer facing associates that are in our financial centers or the associates that are on our phones and you would you like fries with that order approach, which is you get them to try a couple things. And next thing you know, your digital engagement activity is through the roof. Yeah, I have a friend at Google that uses this term quite often. Data and facts will trump people's opinions and points of views. <laughs> sure. And I'm just going to jump in here because we've covered a lot of ground in just over 20 minutes. And I think we you know, are just about to wrap up. But I think one final word just to think about, uh, David, if you want to go first, and then Michael, when we think about the future of, of digital banking and continuing the momentum that we've seen during the pandemic, I'd love if you could just describe in a sentence or two how we continue that momentum, how you keep it going, even as the world somewhat returns back to back to normal, so to speak. So I guess it's three different words that I'd use, Carter, to summarize that, you know, or you know, three different points. The first point is you got to be true to what customers need, want, and desire. Basic building block of banking, make it easy, convenient, and safe for me. So that's priority number one on that side. The second piece of this kind of alludes back to what Michael was saying, which is you can make it easy, you can make it safe, you can make it convenient, but you also have to make it omni-channel. This is not about a mobile app. This is not about a you know, online service, it all has to work together. And that's one of the biggest focus points for us is making sure that it all works together because you can do an awful lot in the digital space, pretty much anything other than taking cash, right? I can't take cash out of my mobile piece of things. But inevitably, if you have a lifelong relationship with a customer, there's going to come a point in time where they need real advice and they're going to want to sit down face to face. So I don't fundamentally believe there's ever a 100% digital only solution. There's always going to be this high tech, high touch. So that that's kind of the build I would build off of what Michael said. And then the last part is the stakes of the game have been risen because it's all about, as I said, individualization, which is, can I make this personal to you? That That's the winning formula. Final word, Michael? Yeah, I wish I had a crystal ball because <laughs> then I could predict uh, what Dogecoin is going to be trading at next week. But I think fundamentally, you know, through this wave, the pandemic, in terms of taxonomy, I believe there's a difference between digitization and digital transformation. What we see a lot of is leveraging the technologies, the business process to make things easier, reduce friction, increase efficiency. 
But by and large, many organizations are still running the similar operating models, business models, and making money the same way. Their revenue pools and profit pools are generally calculated the same way. Transformation is breaking that all apart. And with disruption, really figuring out what are those new operating models? What are those new innovative products and services to offer? And potentially augmenting and finding new revenue streams. And I think with all the building blocks with technology, what we're learning through at the velocity that we can change, um, transformation is really what the future is going to be about in the industry. All right. Thank you all so much for attending. And a big thank you to Michael Tang and David Tyree for this really thoughtful conversation. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Carter.